The midterm elections of 2018 showed Asian Americans flexing their political muscle. The fastest growing minority gets political empowerment, but mental health empowerment? Not yet, exactly. That's next on Emil Amux Takeout. Hi, everyone. And welcome to another episode of the periodic, though infrequent, Emil Amux Takeout. I'm your host, Emil Guillermo. Yeah, the Amuk part, yeah, yeah, it's on my driver's license, and that's not a bad Asian driver joke. It's that for years, I wrote a column called Emil Amuk that appeared in Asian Week. Yeah, E-M-I-L, and then Amuk, A-M-O-K. I've actually had letters, uh, Dear Mr. Amok or Mr. Mock. They think I'm Emily Mock, uh, which might explain some confusion. But anyway, my column ran in Asian Week. At one time, the premier Asian American news weekly in English in the nation. The column is now at the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund site. Aldef.org slash blog. That's A-A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog. And you ought to check it out. They just did an update. It's uh, phone friendly now. Optimized for for the iPhone and Android. That's where the column is now. And, you know, when I get nostalgic for the days when I was host of All Things Considered at NPR, we crank up the gear and we do a podcast. And this one is important today. You know, for Asian Americans, the goal has always been about representation and empowerment as we become woven into the fabric of America. You know, we know what it's like, uh, say, in the political arena, right? And and in the media and, and in practically every area you can think of. So empowerment, representation, that's been the theme. But recently I heard of the Asian Pacific Islander Mental Health Empowerment Conference. It's taking place on November 29th and 30th in Oakland in Alameda County in California. And I just had never heard of that phrase, mental health empowerment, used exactly that way. I mean, we we talk about health care and the importance of getting a checkup and seeing a doctor, but mental health You know, when it comes to Asian Americans, we we just think that this is it. Uh, We we make do, right? I mean, it's not like blood pressure. It's not like a heart attack. It's just your brain, and we don't prioritize it, or there's something else going on. Because in fact, even though Asians are more than thirty percent of Alameda County, which is why they're doing this there in Oakland. Fewer than 2% of the eligible API Medi-Cal beneficiaries get mental health services. Now, we can take a, you know, a a, a teacup half full or half empty approach. I mean, half full, we could say, hey, we're doing pretty good mental health wise. Only 2%, you know, access services. Or we could take the teacup is half empty approach and then maybe say this is another example of how AAPI gets shut out of important public services and we can also say hey look it's our own fault because we don't trust the system or we don't understand the system this idea of Freud and the talking doctors and I mean they wear white coats but are they doctors Are they really? and then there's guys who just talk and there's guys who talk and give drugs and guys who just give drugs do we trust that or we just go see the the guy at church the priest or don't see the priest the shaman the shamans they they could be good uh or maybe it's a fault of the system right they don't talk to us they don't have our they don't speak our language they don't know our culture they're inaccessible well guess what it's all of that but it means asian americans have to learn to speak up and not hide behind shame or fear or the stigma associated with mental health. I mean, here's what we need to do. Well, one of the greatest things I feel that's come up in the last few years are clients, 
family members and caregivers, loved ones, communities really speaking out on education, giving accurate information to counteract all these myths we have about mental health, and speaking openly about the fact that this is nothing to be ashamed of and affects all of us. I'm probably one of the rare professors and professionals who will talk very openly about, yes, and I've also been a caregiver and a loved one, and I've been a client myself. Like, these things are a normal part of life. And you have groups like, you know, the Filipino Mental Health Initiative or the Mental Health Association for Chinese Americans that finally you've got families and people who've been through services speaking out and telling others, like, you can get better. You can face this and you'll get better. You don't have to suffer alone. Uh, that's Dr. Helen Sue. She's a psychologist, a professor and counselor at Stanford University, and the president of the Asian American Psychological Association. And I'll talk more about breaking through and speaking out loud about mental health when we continue with the Meal Amongst Takeout. But first, but first, here are some Emil notes. Check out my website at www.amok.com. And find out more about my one-man show, More Amok, Sex and Affirmative Action. Uh, that's sort of the working title now. I guess I'm kind of married to it now. More Amok, Sex and Affirmative Action. It's coming late January and February to the San Francisco Playground Solo Fest at the Petrero Stage in San Francisco. So go to amok.com for more information. Uh, January 27th, it's like... That's a Sunday. There's three dates. We got three dates in the festival. Come see it. It's a fun. It's funny. There's some funny parts. If you grew up in San Francisco, I talk about going to Lowell High School, and it talks about the gentrification of San Francisco and how that made me crazy. Uh, I talk about Harvard and NPR and Filipino American history. It's it's kind of a memoir, in a way. More amok. Sex and affirmative action. And you'll see, I've taken my storytelling live on stage, and it's fun. So it's at the Petrero stage. Go to amok.com for more information, okay? All right, so that's all the plugs. Oh, you could read the, of course, you read the column at aldef, A-A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund site. And also, check me out at, uh, sometimes, I... Usually around the first Sunday of every month, we do a workshop, a storytelling workshop at the Filipino American National Historical Society Museum in Stockton, the National Museum. If you haven't been to Stockton in a while, it's a good excuse to go. Uh, it's from two to four, usually on the first Sundays. You should call them and check it out. Um, I, I, and we're doing a story slam on December 9th. So... Uh, go to amok.com for more details there. Okay, so Dr. Helen Sue, uh, uh, really very informative. She's a keynote speaker at the Empowerment Conference. So here she is talking about mental health empowerment. Oh, by the way, she is the president of the Asian American Psychological Association. So this is a real thing, this idea of mental health empowerment. And it's in your power but you've got to speak up. Here's Dr. Helen. Helen, first of all, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Mental health is a big topic with me because of personal experience, unfortunately. But, you know, when I saw the, this, uh, you know, this conference coming up, mm -hmm. it talks about political empowerment. And so, you know, and I know political empowerment, Asian Americans know about political empowerment necessary thing asian americans understand we should be represented mm -hmm. but mental health empowerment for asians i mean i've never heard it quite described in that way it's a, it's a new thing are we not asserting ourselves in mental health i think there's a generation now that is asserting themselves among aapis which has been great to see because about 20 years ago when i started this work we really weren't very represented there was a a tiny group of, say, Asian-specific agencies that were started by sort of visionary grassroots AAPI communities. Uh, in terms of political empowerment, we're talking about 
we don't have the politicians or we're not represented by the politicians and we're not, you know, it's like a full spectrum of political donors and political activists and political representatives. And I guess in mental health, is it the same way too? It's like the whole field or that where we're, where we're underrepresented from the caregivers to the, the patients or the people who need the services. Unfortunately, AAPIs are definitely underrepresented on every level. And then it becomes like, well, what's the chicken and what's the egg, right? Like people aren't utilizing the services. Well, sure, there's things that come from maybe ourselves, like our own stigma. But then there's definite systemic barriers. Like I can't get anybody that my insurance you know, covers who has any kind of cultural knowledge, say the least if I have language needs as well. You know, I'm also a clinical supervisor and a professor, and still in my field of psychology, I believe the last survey is still 83% white. Now, not that there aren't great white therapists out there too, but unfortunately, a lot of our API families have had experiences which were really less than helpful with people who were trained in an era that they didn't understand other cultural values and other family formations and values. And then that's just not helpful. And and so there's a kind of like a polite, respect for the institution of the mental health institutions and then they they ignore them asian american communities ignore and, and just go on their own is that it they go without treatment there's a huge population that goes without treatment i believe stan Su did research as far back as the late 70s early 80s where he actually looked at all the data in a huge county i believe it was la and noticed that for asian americans the first contact with the mental health system was usually an emergency. So that speaks really negatively about us holding things and trying to handle them and letting them get worse before we actually seek help. If we went forward and sought help, though, given the demographics of who are the caregivers and their knowledge or lack of knowledge of the AAPI community, would we get the help we need? It really does vary a bit by where you live, truthfully. Yeah, you've got large cities that have agencies with a large number of bicultural, bilingual staff, very experienced. Um, They tend to be, uh, you know, generally on the two large coasts or where you have a large AAPA community like, you know, the Hmong community in Minnesota, certain parts of maybe Texas. But it definitely is even more effort to find the right fit. I think we're growing. Um, the Asian American Psychological Association, which I'm president of, we're about a thousand members nationwide. And the majority of our members are graduate students in early career. So these providers are coming. You know, they're sort of going to be taking charge in the future. Yeah. But what happens to those who came a generation before? Mm-hmm. They're kind of out in the wilderness still, right? It's been difficult. You'll hear things from pioneers in our field who have terrible stories like somebody locked up in the state hospital for years before anyone brought in somebody that actually spoke their language and found out, you know, a story about maybe they weren't so really mentally ill. It was actually this other thing. Um, So there are some pretty awful past experiences. I feel like I'm kind of in this middle generation, but this is where the political piece comes in that if we aren't speaking up, as communities and demanding these things and saying, you know, we do have needs and battling this perfect model minority image, nobody devotes the funding or the resources to us. Yeah, well, that's one of the things that struck me about this particular conference that it's in Oakland Mm -hmm. and it's centered in Alameda County. And and what's interesting about Alameda County, and you live in Oakland and Mm -hmm. and you're a practitioner in the Bay Area, uh, Alameda County it seems to be like a representative microcosm of the AAPI community and that Chinese are at the top. Then there's Filipino, good sized Filipino community. They have the first Filipino um, representative to the California legislature there, mm-hmm. Rob Bonta in Alameda County. Yes. The Indian community is there and a large Southeast Asian community. So the diversity of Asian America is there. 30% of the population in Alameda County. And what struck me about Alameda in the, in the press release, fewer than 2% who are eligible for AAPI uh, benefits under uh, you know, Medi-Cal uh, get mental health services. Well, what does that say when just 2% who are eligible even bother? Are we so well 
mentally, you know, mental health wise, or are we scared? Or are we, what does that 2% figure say when we're 30% of the population? 2% was even worse than I had expected <laughs> when that report came yeah. out. I think it speaks to a few main things. One is we have incredible self stigma as a culture still. Yeah. We do still, and I see this all the time clinically, people will still wait and wait and wait and try to handle it on their own until it just becomes more and more severe. And then, of course, the sicker you are, the slower recovery is. So the lack of access, and a lot of people don't even know that there are services, especially our immigrant community members. I've talked to a lot of people who didn't know services were available or were scared that everyone would find out their business because back in China or India, there aren't confidentiality laws for therapy like there are here. And these are legitimate fears. And sometimes you explain these things and it's like, oh, well, if there's confidentiality and it doesn't go in a school record and it's not public and I can get these services that I deserve and qualify for and they don't need to cost me, that changes everything. Yeah. Well, there's certainly no class barrier given the uh, the fact that some of these services would come at a very low cost, if, if at any cost at all. For Medi-Cal recipients, yes, they get a lot of coverage, especially trying to target youth, because we do see that like the sooner you target small problems, the more you can prevent later ones. What's interesting in Alameda County as a microcosm is that also even our really wealthy parts of the county, like South County, Fremont, where a lot of tech workers, just because these people have money, they're still struggling to access services. And are are they struggling because it's expensive? Are they struggling because they, they, they're too cheap and don't want to spend? Or are they struggling because they don't trust the system and they don't trust what getting into the mental health, health system might mean? They're struggling because there's still stigma, so they're still waiting. And once they're ready to come in, um, the few private practitioners I know in South County, who may be bicultural, who may be bilingual, are just booked, just really swamped. Yeah, you can't get in when you want, if you need it. There's a wait. And then, you know, you there's maybe a window of opening. You say, okay, I'm going to go in and get help. But then it's not there. So you handle it on your own. And you've mentioned that just, you know, earlier in the conversation. What does handling it on your own entail, really? <laughs> and how dangerous can that be? Right. I really have seen and believe that sometimes our own stigma hurts and could kill people, that people don't get help mm. for something that's very severe. So handling it on your own may be, oh, don't talk to anybody outside the family or go to temple or church or do some herbal things or do lifestyle. And those things are all very helpful, but none of those sort of supports or people are qualified to assess like, do you actually have a serious mental health diagnosis that we really need to bring in bigger treatment because it's actually really harming you. Is it a matter of, in some cases, talking? So you can have an alternative. You could talk to a, an elder. You can talk to someone within the community who you trust. I mean, that might seem to be a first step. But when if they subject themselves to a diagnosis, then I guess that leads to other clinical remedies like drugs or something else or maybe would would people need to be committed are they i mean are, do we get to that level mm -hmm. with some of these cases relatively rarely one of the things i also have found to be a barrier to treatment a lot of us from immigrant communities in our home countries we only know of what's so called normal and hospital like commitment which is really scary then if you want to seek treatment. But in reality, I think almost all of us walk around kind of in this middle gray area. We may be struggling a little, and that may vary at different parts in life. We're nowhere near needing to go to the hospital. And we sort of vary in this in-between space. But in a lot of our home countries, there isn't an understanding that, you know, brief or outpatient counseling can maybe be all you need and get you back on track or maybe medications, and that you would be evaluated for that. And that might make a huge difference. But that there are possibilities. Yeah. I mean, is there maybe a misunderstanding of what an outpatient situation or what going to seek help in the mental, uh, in the mental health area, what that might mean? And it's not so much stigma, 
Although we will talk about that a little more, mm. you know, in our conversation, <laughs> but it may be just a fear, a fear of what, well, I don't know what the, the what those guys in the white coats want. Yeah, there's definitely fear. And unfortunately, yeah, depending on where somebody gets in on the system, quality varies really wildly. And this is true. This is again, where the political part comes in that we, we really benefit from having political leaders who understand that mental health is health and that we need these things, you know, so people like Rob Bonta, who's very supportive and Wilma Chan and, you know, Judy Chu, who is a psychologist, because you need people in power to say, hey, we could devote resources to school interventions to make sure kids are getting the supports they need, um, that families are getting the education and supports that they need. You know, you have a situation right now where you have Kaiser Permanente therapists on strike and people have sued Kaiser for denying proper access to clients who really needed support and should have had the right to it based on their insurance. You, you know, these things, uh, and we talked about the, the worried well. I mean, that's sort of the, the stereotype mm-hmm. about psychology. You know, well, you got the money, you go in, you, you pay someone however many, you know, well, uh, it's typical to pay sometimes hundreds of dollars mm-hmm. an hour, uh, for, for, for the talking doctor. And maybe that might indicate to some people that uh, I don't need it. Uh, and, and then that results in the underutilization of mental health treatment. Yet there are very many well to do Asian Americans, professionals. Do they not want to join the worried well or are they too well to be worried? <laughs> One of the concerns I have about how maybe we're not together on this as a community, those who have a lot of resources often are able to use them to go to private sector, but they're not talking about it. So they're not necessarily helping, you know, with the stigma busting um, and normalization. And I've heard, you know, people even with decision-making power say things like, well, you know, Asians, especially in South County, they're rich, they have no problems, we don't need to give them any resources or education. And that's Factually not true that when the Center for Disease Control came to Palo Alto to examine the really abnormal suicide rate here, you know, many of those kids were Asian or half Asian, and they were all from well-to-do families. But they had serious health issues anyway. And you're talking about the the offspring of these successful Asians, uh, I gather from what you're implying. And it leads us to this area of youth suicide. I know you're very concerned about that. Why is it overlooked, you think, in our community? I think it's so painful to talk about suicide. Um, You know, I run a grief group. I used to work at hospice. And one of the extra difficult types of bereavement is survivors of suicide because there's so much shame, self-blame, and stigma But if you actually start talking honestly with people, this is a huge problem in many, many Asian communities. Um, When I did school-based clinical services for many years, I've done them for, I think, at least 10 years in three different school settings, I got called out more for suicidal or completed suicides of teenagers in wealthier neighborhoods than I did when I worked in very low-income neighborhoods. Now, there's many, many factors that contribute to all these things, but we are really struggling with the fact that suicide has gone up in every single age group under 70 in this country in the last few years. So this is a real risk. Now, when you talk about the youth, though, is it the mad? And you talked about mixed Asian families and Asian families, ultra competitive, successful Asian families. Do you think uh, you mentioned model minority, Mm -hmm. the image earlier? Do you think that has contributed to a, the pressure that might create this this you know feeling that oh I'm not doing enough I got to kill myself sort of thing? Does that is that how does that come into play? I think pressure can definitely play into it. You know we've we've had some research studies that refute you know this stereotype that oh all Asian parents are tiger moms like no they're not you know. We've also had parents that I've worked with who said, I'm really not putting pressure on my kid. And yet, because of their high school or their peer group, they still feel incredibly perfectionistic and pressured and overwhelmed. 
And it is the nature of teenagers with their not completely formed prefrontal lobes that they are higher at risk because they don't have the life experience and the wisdom. They are more impulsive um, by nature of their developmental stage. And so things that could maybe be easier to tolerate or have perspective on when you're 30 could really be very dangerous when you're 15. And because they see the example of being reticent and holding it in, that only creates more problems because it they see the example and they follow it, right? They they don't speak out. Yeah. I think perfectionism is a really difficult thing. You'll always hear people joke about in Asian communities. We just love comparing our kids <laughs> to each other, yeah. you know? Um, and yeah. that creates this real climate where it's not okay to say like, well, you know, maybe my kid isn't going to the Ivy League, but he's been dealing with his health and I'm really proud of him and he's going to be fine. And he may get there at a different pace than somebody else, but at least he'll be healthy. What's frightening for us at Stanford is to see how many incredibly high achieving students have very serious mental health problems. And this is consistent in campuses across the country. When you say serious, what do you mean? Serious meaning requiring hospitalizations, requiring medications. I've, it really kind of breaks my heart how many Asian American students in particular will come to me at Stanford and say, I knew I was struggling with my emotional health in high school, but I never felt like I could talk to my parents. And so I've waited until I was 18 and I could seek services on my own. Now, I think as a parent, that would be scary. Well, it's fear of exposing yourself to your parents. There's the stigma. There's the the shame. I guess that plays into mm -hmm. it. Yeah. And how do you overcome that? How do you overcome that shame and stigma? Well, one of the greatest things I feel that's come up in the last few years are clients, family members, and caregivers, loved ones, communities really speaking out on education, giving accurate information to counteract all these myths we have about mental health, and speaking openly about the fact that this is nothing to be ashamed of and affects all of us. I'm probably one of the rare professors and professionals who will talk very openly about, yes, and I've also been a caregiver and a loved one, and I've been a client myself. Like, these things are a normal part of life. And you have groups like, you know, the Filipino Mental Health Initiative or the Mental Health Association for Chinese Americans that finally you've got families and people who've been through services speaking out and telling others, like, you can get better. You can face this and you'll get better. You don't have to suffer alone. But the stigma, there's got to be part of that, that, the reaction to saying, oh, I'm bipolar or I'm this, right? You know, I sought treatment, right? You know, I was uh, committed, you know, briefly, just briefly. Mm -hmm. uh, there must be some real stigma from the reaction of the general community that makes them say, yeah, I'm just going to be quiet. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say anything. Yeah, it's real. And it's a huge part of, I think, what many of us in the community are fighting for is like, battling the stigma, putting out the proper kinds of information instead of these really dangerous myths that people will hear. Like what? Things like, oh, you're immediately going to be in the hospital or you'll, you'll never get married or go to school if you have a mental health condition. Well, that's absolutely not true. But you never hear the stories because no one will share them about, sure, I went to treatment and then I still went to Stanford. Or yes, my partner knows I have you know mood disorder. Doesn't mean we didn't get married. You know, like, we're not talking about that reality, which is actually very common. Yeah. I mean, I do encourage all of us to speak out. And of course, I understand that depending on where we are in our own processing and understanding, and quite honestly, our own privilege and comfort in life, how open we can be. So for example, you do have people who are trying to lead in that. Um, Dr. Ali Matu, who has the psych show, has talked openly about losing a brother to suicide and that that's something that happens painfully often in the South Asian community, but people aren't talking about it. But one family hearing this story might be enough to have them seek help or to say, I'm terrified, I don't know what to do, but I will seek help. That's a key thing I often tell parents that sometimes parents appear uncaring. <laughs> They'll shut down a conversation and say like, oh, you don't think that, or you just need to pray. And it's more because they're freaking out because they don't know what to do. And I always tell no. parents, like, you don't have to know the answer. 
listen and find the answers together. We have good resources these days to lead you in the right direction. You know, there's also the thought that all the stuff that's bothering, you know, me or her or the kid or whatever is external and that inside I'm okay. I I have these external problems. But what do you tell people when it's sort of internal, it's chemical, Mm -hmm. it's, you know, or bipolar situation? How do you communicate that to people and say, look, it's, you know, you can't just change the outside. It's an inside job too. Yeah. How do you, com- how do you convince people to come seek help? It's actually an important point. And I've talked with people about just finding the right kind of help for whatever you need. Um, and that may be that a, a portion of these conditions might be an inherited or a physical vulnerability that happened Like any other condition, you know, when you're already vulnerable, you're more likely to manifest symptoms. And then do you seek medication? Do we make sure that everything else has checked out, that there isn't something else going on contributing to your mental health problem, like your thyroid or whatever, make sure all that checks out. And always remembering that someone may look fine and great to us, but we don't know what they've inherited. We don't know if they've had trauma in their private life that's impacting them. It's a very multifactorial kind of health situation. Yeah. And so what should Asian Americans do when they feel, they feel anxious? I mean, I, I think in the last five years, I've heard anxiety Mm -hmm. level, uh, you know, people talking about anxiety levels come up, uh, uh, rise and uh, to the point where they have to do something about it. What should Asian Americans do to recognize these signs and say, hey, that's for real? Yeah. What are those symptoms that they should, you know, the red flag? Yeah. I mean, you're right about anxiety. It is rising, I think, for multiple reasons that people have some very practical reasons to feel anxious about their futures and emotionally. And then, of course, if you have a predisposition anxiety disorder, that's a real thing, too. There's multiple ways to look at it and and to remember that there are options and that's okay to try multiple options. It's not like you're stuck with one. Of course, there's a medication consultation that might be an option. There's lifestyle changes. There's therapies, including CBT, and there's self-help and there's groups. Actually, the hottest new wellness workshop, this little class we teach at Stanford now, this year we introduced something called Anxiety Toolbox which is just a three session really focused on increasing coping skills. And that's been wildly popular and full every session. And that's been adapted. We got it from Cal Poly. It's being used at universities in many, many areas. Just how do we cope with anxiety and increase our skills? Mm -hmm. And this isn't just a young people thing. You could learn these skills at, at any age, really. Right? Absolutely. And I don't want to forget about adults and even seniors. Um, I've worked with seniors and I often get frustrated that sometimes APIs will say, well, they're old. This just happens. But no, yeah, geriatric yeah. depression is not normal aging or early signs of dementia. That's not normal aging. Like there are treatments and supports for it, people at every stage of the lifespan. You know, this summer there was this movie out. Uh, Crazy Rich Asians, Mm -hmm. that was a big hit. Did the title, did the use of the word crazy, I know it's a sort of a slang type of usage, but did that raise the level of the stigma or were you concerned as a mental health professional when you saw that? With the particular movie, I guess I didn't worry about it so much because Crazy Rich was almost like a good, Mm -hmm. you know, a good kind of crazy. But I generally, yes, absolutely avoid the word crazy. It has a lot of stigma and a lot of languages in our community. You know, I often try to use more precise language, like is something alarming, is something unusual. But I really don't like the word crazy because it has this idea, again, that there's crazy and there's normal and nothing else in between. And I just don't believe that's true at all. Well, you know, uh, if you've read some of my writing, I like to use the uh, the term amok, mm-hmm. which is in the DSM-5. Yes. And I use it as a metaphor, you know, and I, because I have read about amok in the past and how it comes from, you know, this idea that there's, well, as I describe it, you know, people hold stuff yes. in and then there's this explosion. Mm-hmm. And it could be triggered off by whatever, microaggression or in the Philippines, there were 
there was, you know, during World War II, they had amok runners and in uh, Mindanao. Is amok a real thing? Am I wrong to use it as a metaphor? Or is there a serious problem of that in the Asian American community that I should be more sensitive to? The use of amok. <laughs> well, you've been using amok for a long time, and and I don't think you're using it <laughs> yeah. inappropriately. I mean, it, it was under study in DSM. There are terms in our native countries and definitely in our lives about what happens to people and our behavior and our mood and our thinking if we've been oppressed or repressed for too long. And I do think that's a real thing that maybe we don't have an exact perfect Western diagnosis for right now. But the advice I was given, for example, when I got married from my Thai Chinese mother-in-law was like, you know, the only thing to do in life is just endure, like just take it and uh -huh. endure. And it's like, oh, that is terrible mental health advice. <laughs> so well, you shouldn't just, just endure, you should endure, but seek treatment too. I often try to appeal to the practical part about AAPI mentality, the problem solving part. Like, you know, we have such strong cultural stigma, but I try to play up like, listen, very smart people have done many, many, many years of research, and there are multiple things that you can try to solve these problems and evolve new skills. Why wouldn't you do that? You know, and to take away that feeling like, oh, something's wrong with me or wrong with my family that we had this. Like, no, you are constantly evolving and developing as a person and in your health. And sometimes you need new skills and new supports. So take them. One. Final question. It has to do with the community and our status as an evolving community. We have many generations. Uh, immigration uh, occurs. Native, you know, where some of us are native born. Mm -hmm. What does the dissonance between being part of a society and being outside? What does that, or how does that contribute to the either the anxiety level or some of the mental health things that? <clears throat> that some of us might feel. Is that a real thing that we should be aware of? Well, absolutely. The Asian American experience and its unique place can contribute to our mental state. There has been good research about things like having a positive cultural identity is protective for people's moods and mental health. And things like enduring a lot of racism or racial trauma um, is very harmful, especially over repeated time. And so I've worked with people who maybe their presenting problem is they're depressed or anxious, but they root a lot of it back to like racial trauma or bullying that they had experienced at a certain time in their life or not fitting in in certain ways. And, or the fact that my parents were extremely traumatized refugees and that that affected the way they parented me. And so there are unique factors that sometimes do make certain APIs more vulnerable. And of course, you can talk to um, E.J. David about his whole body of work about what about, you know, colonial mentality and what that has done to our own mental status in many of our communities as APIs. But, but the idea is <laughs> to acknowledge it, don't keep it in, let it out. To understand what's happened to get more information and resources and find some that will help you. Yeah. To express and to cope and to get whatever kinds of treatments. And so it may be medicine. It may be changing the way you think. It may be improving your mind, body um, management and skills to reduce symptoms. It may be all of these things. And so one final message to people who might be listening to this and saying, She's striking some chords within, uh, and yet I still feel that barrier that prevents me from accessing mental health, preventing me from going in to seek help. Uh, what should they be thinking or what should they say that'll help them get over that barrier? Mm -hmm. I think if someone's considering getting help for themselves or a loved one, that these days, there are some really good resources. Definitely seek reputable resources if you're going to read books and online. Um, there's some resources even with a lot of the Asian American mental health agencies and APA, the Psychological Association. So you can do a lot of reading 
to get some ideas before you feel comfortable and understand that just asking questions or having initial consultations, again, it's no commitment and it's confidential and it might help point the way to some uh, possible solutions and supports. And it really shouldn't be seen, mental health shouldn't be seen as a DIY kind of thing. <clears throat> Absolutely. Or is it? <laughs> There's a lot that is about empowering the taking care of yourself. That's critical. But right. You know, I, I often tell people like, I don't know why you would try to take care of this yourself. You know, as we say, you wouldn't try to treat your own diabetes. You wouldn't try to set your own broken arm. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Mm -hmm. Helen Sue, Doctor of Psychology, and you're at Stanford now. Yes, Stanford University Counseling and Psych Services. And uh, we didn't even get into <laughs> some of the gender issues mm -hmm. and some of those other issues, but hopefully uh, we can talk again. That would be great. All right. Helen, thank you very much, and, and good luck at the conference yes, this week. Yes, thanks so much. It's good to talk to you after all these years of reading. <laughs> all right. Thank you for that. Dr. Helen Sue, we'll talk to her again, you know, gender issues and all that kind of stuff that she's, you know, just experiencing with her uh, talking about or talking with her Stanford students about. I think it's important. I mean, from the standpoint of the young people who are in it and also, as she said, you know, mental health, it's, it's throughout the community, the young and the old. You can get to the young and try to solve problems before they they grow and fester but we can't forget the older folks uh and i'm actually closer to those older folks than i am to you younger folks but it's a community-wide issue a community-wide problem and uh, we'll tap dr sue for her help throughout when we do more and meal amongst takeout but for now that's it for this show. Hey, if you missed the show and want to hear it more frequently, go to www.amok.com. Leave a voicemail there. And, you know, I might even use it on the show next time. Or uh, if, uh, you know, there's an email box there, just uh, leave a message and say, hey, uh, you know, I kind of like the show. And here's some people you can talk to in the community. Here's some people who have some interesting things to say. And, you know, I'm not really interested in talking to big stars, although, you know, big stars want to talk to us here. I mean, I, mean, I did. I, I had Randall Park once. I, I saw him at a big conference, and he gave us a few minutes. But it really is about people who are doing something in the community for others. Uh, if you got a name you want to say, hey, Emil, you got to talk to this guy, gal, person them they you got to talk to them they're they're real they're they're in it they're dialed in uh, do that at www.amok.com i mean we'll be back definitely with dr helen because you know crazy rich asians was a movie but crazy asians is a societal problem we need to deal with okay that's it I told you about all the plugs, uh, the blog, the new blog at aldef.org slash blog, new site, iPhone optimized. And, and check out uh, www.amok.com for uh, my one-man show coming January 27th, February 4, 1st, and February 7th. Three dates. And that, that's at amok.com. You know, as I, as I record this, Michael Cohen has just ratted out uh, or just, you know, pled guilty that he lied to Congress. And just hearing the analysis from everyone, I mean, the insiders and also the reports, insiders are saying that Trump is just besides himself. He's livid. He's just distracted. He's angry. He's trying to think, uh, you know, he's... I'm wondering about his mental health, frankly. You know, one of the reporters said that Trump said, Cohn is a rat, and they all, everyone hates a rat. And I kept thinking when I heard that, I said, no, no, no. 
rats are okay. Let's not malign rats. They're fine animals. Now, rats, like in, in terms of, say, prison morality, well, that that's it. Those are the people who don't like rats. The bad guys. The guys who are behind bars. The guys who believe in this code of honor. I mean, those kind of rats... I mean, rats should be revered because rats are telling the truth. Rats are the whistleblowers. So maybe all these murmurings that Donald Trump is going through some kind of that he's you know distracted and he's uh, upset by all this uh, by by the developments with Cohn and Manafort and the talking uh, all the talk about uh, giving a a pardon. To uh, to Manafort, I think maybe he's cornered, or maybe he's. I don't know. I I'm just concerned about President's uh, mental health, especially as he goes to the G20 summit. He's already canceled his his uh, his uh, meeting with Putin because, well, what's he going to do with Putin now? Hey, I, Vladimir, they found out when I, I wanted to give you a penthouse while I was running for, for president. I'm sorry. Can't, he, he can't, he can't do that. So, I don't know, I, I guess I can email the White House Dr. Helen's uh, information. Because I, who, who would his, who would the White House psychiatrist be? Or would he just talk to Melania? I don't know. You know, you, this is the thing about mental health. You start going down the rabbit hole of mental health and thinking about it. And then you're concerned about everyone that you can, you know, that you see and hear about, like, uh, like the president is a real issue. So I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the episode today, Dr. Helen Sue's, uh, interview. And, um, like I said, uh, we'll have her back on soon. That's the show. I'm Emil Goamuck. Goamuck.